good morning, evening, afternoon, night, whenever you're watching this. Welcome back to another AP Psychology video. Last time we talked about classical conditioning, and today we continue our conversation by expanding our review to operant conditioning. Remember, classical conditioning is all about learning to associate two stimuli together to elicit a response. Operant conditioning, on the other hand, is all about learning by associating behaviors with their consequences. Operant conditioning has its roots with B.F. Skinner, who was a behaviorist. Skinner believed that individuals would be more likely to do certain behaviors when they received certain reinforcements and would be less likely when they were punished. So operant conditioning is a type of learning where behaviors are shaped by their consequences, either through reinforcement or punishment. This idea can be seen when looking at the law of effect, which states that behaviors resulting in positive outcomes become strengthened, while those followed by negative outcomes are weakened. And since we're about to talk about behaviors and their consequences, I thought it'd be a good idea to remind you to take out the guided notes for this video. That way you can remain active in your learning and avoid any negative consequences that could come from forgetting this information. Now, consequences can be good or bad bad. A consequence is merely a result of an effect of an action. When looking at consequences, you are going to come across reinforcement and punishment, which both can be positive or negative. For AP Psychology, make sure you remember that positive means you are adding something, and negative means you are taking something away. It's not about good or bad. And I'll say that one more time, just to make sure those students who are way in the back understand. Positive and negative is not about good or bad. Positive reinforcement involves adding something desirable to increase the likelihood of a behavior occurring. For example, let's say that you mow the lawn, and after you mow the lawn, your parents give you $10. This ends up motivating you to mow the lawn again since you want more money. Or say that every time you smash that like button on a video of mine and subscribe, I show you a picture of these adorable puppies. Seriously, how cute are these? Ultimately motivating you to subscribe and smash that like button. On the other hand, negative reinforcement involves removing something unpleasant to increase the likelihood of a behavior occurring. For instance, when you get in the car and don't buckle up, the car starts beeping at you. This annoying sound doesn't stop until you buckle your seatbelt. Trying to get the annoying sound to stop motivates you to buckle your seatbelt. And next time when you get in the car, you buckle your seatbelt right away. Notice that in our first example, you are given $10 to cut the grass. The money is being added to the situation, so it's positive reinforcement. Whereas with the car beeping, you do an action to remove the sound. So it's a negative reinforcement. Both of these examples are reinforcements because the money and the removing of the sound motivate the individual to perform the action in the future. Now, generally reinforcers are either primary or secondary. Primary reinforcers are naturally rewarding. This is because they will satisfy basic needs like food, water, or warmth. Secondary reinforcers, on the other hand, are learned rewards, often associated with primary reinforcers, such as money, which can be used to purchase different items, such as food. Now, let's say that instead of trying to increase a certain behavior, we actually want to decrease a behavior. Well, instead of using reinforcement, we would utilize punishment, which again can also be positive or negative. Positive punishment involves adding something unpleasant to decrease a certain behavior. For example, a student in your class keeps talking and disrupting class, and as a consequence, the teacher gives the student extra homework. In this example, the homework is being given to the student to reduce the student from disrupting class in the future. Also notice in this example, the homework is being added. That's what makes a positive punishment. On the other hand, let's say that a student comes to class without having completed their homework for the day. Instead of getting to watch the movie with the rest of the class, the teacher has the students sit in the hall and finish their homework. This would be an example of a negative punishment, which is when something desirable is removed to decrease a particular behavior. In this example, the student is being removed from the fun movie day as a consequence of not completing their homework making this a negative punishment. At the end of the day, just remember, if a stimulus is being added and it increases the behavior, it is a positive reinforcement. 
If the added stimulus decreases the behavior, it is a positive punishment. If a stimulus is taken away and the behavior increases, then it is a negative reinforcement. And lastly, if a stimulus is taken away and the behavior decreases, it is a negative punishment. Now, I'll be honest, it's really easy to mix up these terms, especially when we're looking at real life situations. So to help you out, I came up with different scenarios and created practice problems to help you master these concepts. Plus, I added explanations for each of the scenarios, so even if you get it wrong, you can understand why each answer is either right or wrong. You can find these extra resources inside my ultimate review package. Just just click the link down below once you're done with the video. So just like with classical conditioning, operant conditioning can also be impacted by discrimination and generalization. With operant conditioning, discrimination means that the individual can tell the difference between which behaviors get rewarded and which don't. While generalization means the individual applies what they learned through conditioning to similar situations. So reinforcement discrimination occurs when an individual learns to respond only to specific cues or signals that indicate when a behavior will be reinforced. While reinforcement generalization happens when a response that has been reinforced in the presence of one stimulus also occurs in the presence of a similar stimuli. Now when it comes to operant conditioning, it is common practice to use shaping. This is when reinforcement is used gradually to teach a complex behavior by rewarding small steps that lead towards the final desired behavior. Each time an individual or even animal performs a behavior that's a little closer to the targeted behavior, they'll receive a reward. Over time, the reinforcements are given only for actions that are increasingly similar to the final goal. For example, we could look at the Skinner box in which B.F. Skinner used to try and get rats to push a lever to get Food. To do this, Skinner put a rat inside a box, which had a speaker, a light, and a lever. At first, the rat would get a pellet whenever the rat moved closer to the lever, but eventually the rat would only get a food pellet when the rat pushed down the lever. This is shaping in action. Now, even if shaping's done perfectly, we can see that some learned behaviors for animals will fade due to instinctive drift. This limitation in shaping behaviors is due to the fact that certain natural behaviors are essentially hardwired into an animal. So even though reinforcement can be highly effective, we can see that certain behaviors are harder to shape especially if they go against an animal's natural instincts. Next, we need to talk about superstitious behaviors, which occur when people mistakenly believe that an action leads to a certain outcome, even though the two things are not actually connected. For example, if a basketball player always wears certain socks during a game and they end up playing really well, they might think that the socks are lucky or played a role in the game, resulting in them wearing the socks the next game. This belief is known as a superstitious behavior, and it is called caused due to coincidental reinforcement, which is reinforcement that occurs when a behavior is mistakenly reinforced because it coincides with a positive outcome, even though the behavior itself is not the actual cause of the outcome. All right, so in this video, we have talked a lot about reinforcement, but we have yet to talk about reinforcement schedule. We can see that how reinforcement is given directly impacts how fast an individual will learn and maintain certain behaviors. Now, when I say reinforcement schedule, I'm talking about when and how often reinforcers are given to an individual for a behavior. There are two main types of reinforcement schedules. The first type is continuous reinforcement, which is when reinforcement is provided every time a correct behavior is performed. This schedule is really useful for quickly establishing new behaviors, but may not make the behaviors as resistant to extinction when the reinforcement stops, since the individual is solely focused on the extrinsic motivation. Remember, Extrinsic motivation is when an individual is motivated to perform a particular behavior because of an external reward or to avoid an external punishment. This is different from intrinsic motivation, which is when an individual has a desire to do something for their own sake. There is no external punishment or reward. Now, the other reinforcement schedule is partial reinforcement, which is when reinforcement does not occur with every correct behavior, making it more resistant to extinction. Partial reinforcement can happen in four different ways. Now, before we talk about each of the different schedules, I want to go over this chart to make sure you know how to read 
read it. Because honestly, lots of students get confused here. This chart shows how quickly someone responds over time based on how rewards are given. Each line shows a different reinforcement schedule. The Y axis tells us how many actions are completed over a period of time, while the X axis shows us how much time has passed. When looking at this graph, remember the steeper the slope, the faster the response rate. If a line is straight, it indicates constant responding, whereas scalloped lines show pauses and bursts in the responses. All right, now that we've spent a little time with the chart, let's break down each of these reinforcement schedules, starting with fixed interval, which is when reinforcement is given to an individual after a set amount of time has passed. The time here is key. It does not matter how many times an individual performs a behavior, the individual gets the reinforcement after a set period of time. For example, most jobs pay workers every two weeks, so every two weeks, people get paid regardless of how much they work. Now, if the individual is an hourly worker, the amount they get paid may change depending on how often they work but the frequency in which they get paid does not. Oftentimes, a fixed interval schedule creates a scalloped response pattern when graphed. You can see the scalloped response pattern here. Notice that there is a low response rate at first, but the response rate increases as the reinforcement time gets closer. For example, if we go back to our worker example, if you get paid on Friday, you have more money in your bank account, so you might relax a little instead of picking up more shifts. But as the week goes on and you spend your money, you'll need to be able to make more money, so you'll start picking up more shifts again until you get paid. Now the next type of partial reinforcement is variable interval, which is when reinforcement is given after an unpredictable amount of time. Here the individual has no idea when the reinforcement will be given. Variable interval often results in a steady and moderate response rate, but it also does result in the slowest rate of responding, since the individual never knows when the next reward is coming. For example, you check your phone throughout the day since you never know when that special someone who you just gave your number to is actually going to text you. Could be in 10 minutes, maybe an hour, or maybe they've already texted you. Did you check? Oh no, God! No, God, please, no! 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 Up next, we have a fixed ratio, which is when reinforcement is given after a specific number of behaviors. This often produces a high response rate with a short pause after the reward. For example, many restaurants have a reward program that gives you a free meal or side after you eat at their restaurant a certain amount of times. This often motivates people to come back to the restaurant. Lastly, there is a variable ratio, which is when reinforcement is provided after an unpredictable number of correct behaviors. This leads to a high and steady response rate. This type of reinforcement is the most resistant to extinction, since at any moment the individual could be rewarded. A slot machine at a casino uses this reward schedule. Sometimes the machine will pay out after the 10th pull, and sometimes it's just the second pull, and sometimes it's the 50th pull. The individual doesn't know when the payout is coming and is motivated to keep playing since that next poll could be the winner. So we can see depending on what an individual is trying to accomplish with rewards, they will utilize different reward schedules. If a person wants to teach a new behavior quickly, they will most likely use continuous reinforcement. Or if a person wants to try and make the new behavior resistant to extinction, they'll most likely use partial reinforcement, focusing mainly on variable schedules which will take longer to teach the behavior, but make the behavior harder to be extinguished. Now for AP Psychology, it is important you understand how these different reward schedules not only impact response rates, but also how they work in the real world. So to help you out, I created a practice quiz that looks at different scenarios to help you practice applying these concepts. You can find it inside my ultimate review packet by clicking the link in the description down below. All right, now to wrap up this video, we need to talk about one more concept, and that is learned helplessness, which is when an individual or animal believes they cannot influence or change an event in life even when the reality is they can. Generally, this occurs because the individual or animal was repeatedly in a situation where no matter what they did, bad outcomes kept happening. This leads the individual to believe that their actions have no impact on the situation, resulting in them feeling powerless. Later, when the individual is in the same or similar situation, they'll often give up or won't even attempt to change things since they believe there's nothing that they can do. Notice that with learned helplessness, the individual or 
our animal has been conditioned to believe that they are powerless and their actions are meaningless. For example, let's say that you are studying for an upcoming test and end up getting an F on the test. When the time comes for the next test in the class, you study again, only to get another F. Eventually, you develop the idea that you are a bad test taker and there's nothing you can do to do well on tests. You've tried studying and it didn't work. So the next time a test comes up in the class, you decide, why study? What's the point? Now, I do want to point out that individuals and animals can overcome learned helplessness. To do so, they must rebuild their confidence and belief that their actions and behaviors matter. And just like that, another video is done. Now comes the time to practice. Make sure you go over to the Ultimate Review Packet and take those different practice quizzes that I created. Also, don't forget to check out the comment section for the answers to the review questions on the screen right now. And while you're down there, consider subscribing. As always, I'm Mr. Sin. Thank you so much for watching this video, and I will see you next time online.